Hi, and welcome to AP Human Geography with Dustin Fowler. Today, in this lecture, we're going to talk about the five themes of geography, and which really are kind of the cornerstone of everything we're going to discuss in AP Human Geography, or even if you're taking a world history survey class. All right, so here's the way it breaks down. Mr. Help. If you can remember Mr. Help, you'll be doing pretty good to remember the five themes of geography. Why? Because it is an acronym that is designed to help you to memorize the five themes. So we're going to take it one at a time, starting right now. So looking at the M in our acronym, talking about movement, we're looking at how people, ideas, and things get from one place to another across space on Earth. And then this is a very important concept, and a huge component of AP geography is the spatial component. So people getting around today is far different from how people would have gotten around, say, 100 years ago or even maybe 20 years ago, in particular when you think about the spread of ideas or diffusion. Okay, so today we might have trucks, cars, and airplanes that can get us from point A to point B on the world map. Back in the day, maybe the 1750s, for example, would have been predominantly boat. Later on, you will have had railroads and things like this, but for the most part, people use traditional horse and buggy to get from one place to another, so that a trip, say, from Columbia to Charleston, South Carolina, would have perhaps taken a huge amount of time, and people wouldn't have been as willing to go forth. However, today with modern roads and with trucks and cars and things of that nature that are substantially more gas efficient and can go further with less, um, we've basically decrease the amount of distance from one place to another because we've decreased the time it takes to get there. We're going to talk about this uh, space-time compression in a later video, but this is kind of the point of movement is it talks about how people and ideas go from one place to another. What's another example? Well, what about Amazon Prime? Get an item in two days? Sure, we love that, you know, in our fast-paced American society. If you go on and order something online, chances are it's going to come from maybe even another country. I'm not just saying Amazon, but in general, you might be getting something from China. Or you might be getting something from somewhere else. So movement discusses and considers how something gets from one place. In terms of ideas, today we have social media. Sometimes the news has to give credit to a person on Twitter whenever they are discussing news stories. This is pretty cool, and it goes to show just the fast pace and the extent ideas are spread rapidly from you and me across space. So movement can actually have to do with any of these different things. Uh, talking about how people, places, or uh, people, things, or goods uh, get from one Next, let's do region. Mr. Right, M, and then R stands for region. And what we're looking at here is geographers going to ask themselves a question. How are things similar or different from one place to another? So what is it exactly that we use to characterize what our region is? Well, it can be a political boundary, or it can be physical characteristics, or it can even be cultural characteristics, right? Where, for example, would the Middle East be? Well, that might depend on who it is that's defining it. And so regions can either be perceptual or vernacular regions, which is based on the perceptions of individuals. So somebody might say the Middle East includes Turkey. Some others might say the Middle East includes all of North Africa. But then you might have others that say it does not. And so it really depends on how you define that region as to whether or not it's going to be one. That's perceptual. Now, you've also got two other types of regions, formal regions and functional regions. And so let's look at the first. Formal, formal regions are those that have a set boundary that either you're, you're going to be there or you're not. State boundaries are formal bo uh, boundaries, um, which would help to define a region. Also, mountain ranges are formal boundaries or have, might have uh, formal boundaries as well, or uh, lakes or areas that have geographic characteristics. Those might be an example of a formal region. And looking finally at the functional region, you've got areas that provide a function would basically consume or I guess make up that different region area. So you might look at radio stations. Well, if you're going down the interstate far enough, eventually you're going to get to a point where you don't have a reception anymore. That's the end of that functional region and you're entering into another. And so you see functional regions and they oftentimes look almost like some kind of a round type shape that shows the extent to which a service provided in the center may or may not be provided. The next, the H as in help, all right, you're looking at human environment. Human environment, H-E, that's where the H-E and help comes from. Human environment interaction. 
how do we interact with our environment around us and how does it help us to survive? How do we have to modify it in order to survive? These are things that we're looking at when when geographers ask, uh, the, you know, when they consider human environment interaction, they, they ask, how do we as people interact with and exist in conjunction with the environment around us? And so the American South, again, is a good example. If you look at hurricanes on the southeast coast, it's kind of a given. So we kind of learn to live with it or expect to have them. All right, so this is kind of one way where we might interact with our environment. But if you look at a more consistent and daily basis, what are the roads that you're going to use to travel? What are the possible weather that you might run into on your way back and forth to school or to work or wherever it is you might be going? These are different things that are going to, uh, uh, we're going to, uh, de depending on what it is the weather's calling for, we may bring a raincoat or an umbrella, or we may wear short sleeves and shorts. All right, these are going to be examples of human environment interaction. Other examples of human environment interaction may include how we use the land. For example, with different types of agricultural practice, what we put on the cultural landscape in order to, to live our lives, as well as the different types of cultural things, such as what somebody might wear in the Sahara Desert. It's going to look a lot different from what people might wear here. Um, and I say cultural. It might be part cultural, but also might be because the heat's so blazing hot, if you don't cover your skin... Still, others might use uh, different types of snow boots or different types of skis or something like this whenever they're in snowy areas. And so it really depends, once again, on the region, all right, how it plays a similar or different, but uh, uh, and culture and things like this that go into how people are going to use the environment and interact with it. So it really is one of the, I mean, if there is one theme that's probably more important than others, at least to you and me on a daily basis, it may be this very one right here that kind of helps us to determine exactly how we're going to live our lives every single day we walk out the door. The L and the uh, Mr. Help acronym that we're looking at to help us remember the five themes of geography is probably the one that most people think about when they consider geography. That's right. Location. Where are we? Where is it? Where is that? Where was that? Where are you going? Um, where? How do you get to where that is? Okay, we always ask these questions in relation to all sorts of things. Uh, you might hear the word Djibouti on the news. Well, what the heck is Djibouti? Where is it? All right, where's the birthday party we're supposed to go to? Or how in the world are we going to get to Boston, Massachusetts? These are all different things that we're going to look at and the geographers are going to ask whenever they consider location. So where is it is the important thing here. And so there are two different ways that we measure where something is. First of all, if you're looking for McDonald's, you're not going to ask someone for latitude and longitude coordinates ever, all right? You might ask him for an address if you're trying to put it into a GPS, but we don't go around asking for absolute location, which is going to be using a grid, latitude and longitude coordinates to say how far north or south something is or how far east and west. What we are going to do is we might say, okay, how do you get to McDonald's? Oh, well, you're going to go and turn left on Duncan and then right on Aiken Augusta Highway and bam, there you go. You've got McDonald's. This is a little bit more realistic for most of us and we live by understanding landmarks or where something is in relation to other things. Relative location is exactly that. You're trying to figure out where something is in relation to something else. McDonald's is across the street from CVS in the same little parking center as Bilo. That's a little bit more of an accurate way and we can use that information to get to McDonald's. So when do we use latitude and longitude? Well it becomes a little bit more important when we're trying to find the exact mountain or we're trying to find the exact location using like maybe if you're geocaching or something. I don't know if you guys are muggles or if you know about geocaching, but um, you might also want to know the latitude and longitude coordinates of a city. You might want to know it for, I don't know, if you're planning on locating a business somewhere, you want, might want to understand exactly what it is in, in, a, in a way that will help you to, to survey land better. I'm not really sure. Uh, there's a whole lot of different applications for understanding latitude and longitude, and you can use uh, 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 your GPS to look up latitude and longitude and figure out your coordinates. You can also go onto Bing Maps or Google Maps and find exact latitude and longitude coordinates of things as well. And so there are definitely some applications for that and it's relatively simple to do today uh, uh, you know, using, using GPS. The last of the five themes, the P in help, is going to be place. And so when, you, when you're looking at place, geographers are going to ask themselves, what are the characteristics of that location? What are some things that make it uh, unique in the world in, we, in which we live? Now, some people get this really confused with region. Region compares different places on Earth 
and can look at their characteristics, both physical and cultural, as a way of comparing. But place in and of itself talks about the characteristics. So if you're looking at the characteristics of where you might live, you might be looking at what types of average weather you might have. You might look at what types of people live in that region in where you live. You might look at what are the buildings like architecturally. These are different things you might consider when you're considering place. And sometimes later on in this course, we're going to also differentiate between site and situation. All right. The site characteristics and place typically are kind of the same thing. All right. So you're understanding the character of a place. What is it like is the question that geographers are going to ask themselves whenever they're trying to study place. So there you go. Quick, easy, painless rundown of the five themes of geography for AP Human Geography. If you kind of like the video or you like, you know, knowing a little bit more about AP Human Geography, feel free to subscribe to my channel. I'll be updating videos as I can.